Michael Malice here, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We got with us one of our most requested guests by popular demand. Uh, I asked my next guest, Michael Tracy, how he wanted to be introduced, and he said, "Journal, I don't know, <laughs> journalist and Twitter jerk. So I guess the difference between us is you're a journalist. I don't know. Something is really wrong with the popular demands that you're being... Foisted, that are being foisted upon you if that's the state of affairs. Well, I think uh, – well, I'll tell you why I think people uh, want to hear me talk to you. OK, yeah. I think you are one of the best people on Twitter because your takes are unorthodox. You're not tribal in terms of Team Red or Team Blue. And you genuinely get upset by what I think is the number one issue to get upset about, which is advocacy for war. <laughs> and the fact that people can blithely talk about war in the same way that they can talk about you shouldn't wear white after Memorial Day, to me, is one of the great horrors of contemporary politics. Okay. Well, thank you. No, I think that's accurate. You know, when I think about it now and I try to step away from myself, which is not entirely possible because we're all living in our subjective realities, but... I do think that I am abnormally incensed when I feel as though there are partisan talking points that could cloud the reality of what war is. And I think in the Trump era, especially, you have Democrats assuming talking points opportunistically that put them in a certain box. And for whatever kind of sick, depraved reason, that box is often a hawkish box because in discrete ar arenas, Trump actually has, you know, taken on certain positions that if you're going to oppose him because you hate Trump, then you're also making a hawkish point to counter him. And I think that dynamic is really sick. I mean, there are ways to counter Trump from the opposite direction, like he's caused a lot of civilian casualties in pre-existing war zones where he's intensified bombing campaigns and so forth. So I wish that was more of a focus, more than, you know, he's rubbing elbows with Kim Jong Un and gave him a, uh, and gave him a big bear hug and you know loves dictators and you know shouldn't be doing diplomacy, so you know I, th that really is a dynamic that I've honed in on quite a bit recently and I think that kind of maybe lends itself to why you made that observation. Uh, one of my dear readers pointed out that you were on the fifth column, which is co-hosted by my buddy Camille and my buddy Matt Welch and my buddy Moynihan and my buddy Anthony Fisher. Uh, that's a lie. I hate them all. Uh, useless people. Um, and they said that you don't consider yourself a leftist. Did they say? Did I say that, or did they say that? That's who said a, that? that was the claim. Claim. Do you want, do you want my claim litmus, by whom? By one of my dear readers. Do you want to hit? Let's get the litmus test. Then we'll find okay. out right now. <laughs> this is how you find out if someone's a leftist or not. Right? Ready? Are you now, or have you ever been? No, no. I have my question, and it works 100% of the time. Okay. I, I said this the first time I was on Rogan. Do you, do you, Michael Tracy, and I may remind, may I remind you, you're under oath, do you think some people are better than others? Well, under penalty of perjury, no. Yes. I, I don't know. That, I, I, I reject the premise of that. See, a, a right winger question. says yes, and a left winger gives a speech. That's how, <laughs> li That literally is what I said in Rogan. That's exactly what just happened. So you are a leftist. Well, I mean, if you say so, I just think that I could imagine an intelligent right winger also rejecting the premise of that question because it dichotomizes a very complex set of moral claims. Right. That is the leftist perspective. <laughs> uh, what if you had a concern? What if you had a non leftist giving you the same answer? There's that's not then, possible. Then the, it would undermine the utility of the question. There's no non leftist. I will find you a conservative. Conservatives somewhere. are leftists who have vaginas. <laughs> okay. Out of their on their faces. And those are their mouths. No, I think conservatives are very I'm conjuring up a mental image right now no, that I, I feel think, like it's gonna distract me with the, the I rest think of the and show. I'm sure you'd agree that many conservatives are degenerate leftists who don't even realize it. They have accepted all the oh. premises of leftism, and, and my quote, as you know, probably, hopefully, is conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. Everything that the left advocated 20 years ago, today's conservative champion is if they were always there from the beginning. Chad Felix Green, who is a prominent uh, gay conservative, he had this article for Federalist, maybe, saying, like, I've got, it's harder for me to come out as 
conservative than it was coming out as gay. He made the claim that the quest for gay rights was started by conservatives. <laughs> and uh, and if anyone knows anything about the history of gay rights in America, the Mattachine Society, which was the first gay rights organization, were Marxist. The person who attacked the cops at Stonewall was a drag queen. Oh, was that the piece where it's like being a gay conservative is as bad now as being – I forget what he was analogizing it to. No, he was saying it's easier to be gay now. Everything that they said that would happen as a result of being gay actually happened when I came out as conservative. People shun me. I might get fired. Okay. And it's just like I couldn't bring myself to bother to read that one. I had to for my other show, and I, I. No, you chose to. Let's be honest. Okay, I chose you had, to. You had you just had, like he chose his orientation. I chose some, to read that article. You had some debased compulsion that caused you to. Well, yeah, here's the thing, and I think you'll agree. Sometimes when you see a headline that is so egregious, you think, you know what? Sometimes the headline is completely not like the article. And the article's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, maybe this is the headline. And then I read the article, and I'm like, oh my god. No, I mean, frankly, I wouldn't have been surprised about what was under the headline considering the publication it was in. And okay. they have a, do have a tendency to publish things like that. Not that I reject categorically everything that's ever appeared on The Federalist, but you know, that's just not – it wouldn't have been shocking. So let's talk about uh, – Can I just make a point about this please, rhetorical question? Please, get the, get the mic a little closer. Let me just make, about the, make a point about this rhetorical question, right? So if, you were, if I were a conservative and I would be answering according to the way that you say you know, non-leftists always answer, I would say yes – People are better. Well, what would be my criteria for saying that one person is intrinsically better than the, than the other? I feel like one criteria. No one said intrinsically. Well, see, this is why the speech comes in because you have the cognitive dissonance. There is no scenario where you. Well, can't... why isn't it intrinsic if you're just making that absolute judgment? I didn't, no one said someone. absolute either. See, you're, you're, this is okay, you. Well, that's why you need a more complex question. That's or else why it doesn't you capture the nuances. That's why. You, that's the whole thing. The left brain is looking for nuance because it's not comfortable with the premise, whereas the right is like, yeah, obviously. No matter how you construct it, there's going to be some people better than others. Other, unless you have an essential belief in its, uh, egalitarianism as the basis of your worldview, which I, I do not at all. Okay. I mean, I, not, I, I'm not I, saying I it's just, a pejorative. I just feel like the, there's nothing wrong with being I, left. It's I, okay to be left. Okay. I, <laughs> it, it just, I feel like it's a weird way to pigeonhole somebody be, based on. It's not know. a pigeonhole if it's half the universe. A pigeonhole is tiny. Well, for me individually, it's a pigeonhole. Because you're using a binary yes or no question to conclude something much broader about my overall personal and political orientation. Uh, so that it is a pigeonholing in that sense. The fact that the question's predictive <laughs> abilities are 100%, I think, speaks you know, to the efficacy of the question. Perhaps. I mean, uh, we can find the clip on Rogan. <laughs> I, I, I actually said verbatim, like, okay. you say yes or you give a speech. And, okay. you gave can speech I, and you're still giving the speech. <laughs> well, I'm going to move on from the speech now because you mentioned Rogan and there, there was an amazing clip today from Rogan, I guess, yesterday. Did you see this yet? I have not. Okay. Well, I'm a loyal subscriber to JRE Clips, the YouTube yeah, yeah. channel, which, you know, puts out the, the best clips um, from the, the podcast. And Barry Weiss was on. Oh, yeah. Now, I think. Some of the overheated reaction to Barry Weiss is just that overheated. Yes. Like people are weirdly obsessed with her and, you know, I find her annoying in some ways. She makes a good point occasionally. That's kind of like basically the prism through which I view a lot of people and, annoying but occasionally and, makes good and, points. And let me agree with that. Just because someone is annoying doesn't mean they need to be made into a pariah. No, but but th that said, she makes a lot of facile arguments that call into question why she's been given such a prominent platform at the New York Times. Sure. Like it's not like she's blogging somewhere. She's – at the most influential publication, arguably in the entire world. Sure. So, you know, the level of scrutiny she receives, I guess, is legitimate in that way. But you know, it's not, and she's being uh, you know, celebrated on Bill Maher all over the place. So whatever, I, I don't care that much about her, frankly. But she was on Joe Rogan, and I guess they were talking about 2020, meaning the 2020 presidential yeah. primaries, and like Joe Rog Joe was like, "So who's going to win?" And I don't know. It was just kind of like speculative sure. kind of banalities. And he brought up he brought up Tulsi Gabbard, yeah, who I've been talking about and covering because I find her interesting in numerous respects. But love her. But her initial, but Barry Weiss's initial initial response to Joe even bringing up Tulsi Gabbard was like uh, shock and appall. Uh, she was shocked and appalled that Joe Rogan would even have the oh, gumption yeah. to bring up Tulsi Gabbard. And Barry Weiss was like, "Don't you know she's an Assad toady?" And then Joe was like, an Assad toady? What does toady mean? And then Barry Weiss couldn't even define the word toady. And then she asked Jamie, the guy off to the side, right? Can you look up toady? And then she misspelled toady. 
So there was like a minute and a half of just total cringeworthy, awkward silence while they were trying to figure out what Tony was. And I was like, okay, that's kind of a minor issue compared to the actual allegation you just made about sure. Tulsi Gabbard. So do you have any evidence to suggest that that's a, that that's a valid label to apply to Tulsi Gabbard? And she was like, I don't know. I guess I read a few things. I don't want to be making fun of her voice, right? I'm just yeah, kind of yeah, like sure, – sure. Her trying attitude. to convey the stupidity of this moment, which everybody should go look at because it's just that amazing. But she had she had no factually based explication for this pretty damning indictment she just made about a prominent political figure. So I mean, I mean, you brought up Joe Rogan. I just happened to see no, that a couple hours we're ago. We're going to talk about Tulsi at length okay. because I'm a, I'm a big admirer of what she's trying to do as well. First of all, I'm very glad to see that you my. Uh, speculation that your conception of culture is exactly that of George Costanza in front of a monitor where there's a lot of like oh, looking away and gnashing of teeth. So the fact that that just happened, I'm a lot of happy. flamboyant hand <laughs> gestures and things. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'm very happy to see that. And I can relate um, because again, it's, it's one thing if you were like, I don't like if she had said, or anyone has said, I don't like Tulsi Gabbard because I think she's too easy on Assad. That's a legitimate argument and a fair point of view. What the press does is they will take a – it's literally the equivalent of a warning label for like CDs in the 90s, right? Contains pro, uh, <laughs> uh, explicit <laughs> lyrics, right? It's like Tulsi Gabbard, comma, who is an Assad toady, comma. Right. And from then on, it's like I don't need to hear anything else this person has to say. Now, let me – hold on. Let me finish. It's – here's the other thing. Let's suppose she's a complete Assad toady. That doesn't mean she doesn't have good ideas about education or good ideas about race relations in America, but the, as soon as they, what they do is they give you a reason to not have to think about a certain person any further, and then you can just dismiss them and throw them in garbage. And why I like Tulsi, although I, would, I don't vote and I would never vote for her, is she's unorthodox. She's in many ways like Ron Paul. She's like, look, you guys are corporatists and you're full of crap. And she took a huge personal and political risk by taking that trip that she took in January 2017 yeah. – just prior to Trump assuming office, or maybe it was just after, I forget, January 2017. She, she was accompanied by Dennis Kucinich, the former two-time presidential candidate, ran as a Democrat, who was also pilloried and mocked and ridiculed and ostracized because he assumed unorthodox, or unorthodox foreign policy positions primarily, although he was also you know a progressive on domestic issues, and so is Tulsi. Very much so, yeah. But – but that's why I've been honing in on this Assad toady or apologist or defender attack so much. And people have been saying, oh, you love Tulsi. I, I mean, not exactly. I'm not endorsing Tulsi, right? I and mean, that's I don't feel like that's my proper role anyway. Right. I, I would probably vote for Bernie in the primary. Sure. But the way she's been introduced to the public, which is, as you said, like slapping this parental advisory label on her so that people just shut down their critical thinking skills and just automatically kind of – Yes. reflexively disqualify her that to me is offensive yes especially because the basis for it is so shabby yes she did not say anything that could be remotely portrayed as defending assad at any point her crime was meeting with assad for the purpose of trying to achieve some diplomatic reconciliation in a country that had been for years flooded with weaponry by the cia the saudis who God knows who, how many other geopolitical forces, and she was attempting a different approach because it was sensible and rational for her to want to do so. So she assumed a huge risk in doing that. And I think that the way that it's been tr twisted and contorted should really trouble anybody who is not even necessarily wanting to support her. But wanting a rational discourse, I mean, I guess or that's once, a far-flung hope at this point. Or wants a minimization of war. Yeah. During the Bush era, as I'm sure you remember, the big attack against him, which has a lot of basis in fact, is this guy's a cowboy. He's unilaterally doing these things. He's not sitting down with our partners and our friends in the rest of the world. We need more diplomacy. We need less you know, U.S. heavy-handed bullying action. And as soon as you have someone trying diplomacy, diplomacy means talking to people you don't like. Yeah. That is almost literally the I, – I don't have Jamie here. But it's not the dictionary definition, but it's close enough to it that if you want diplomatic solutions, you need diplomacy with people you hate. It's not just like, oh, calling up Theresa May and being like, hey, things are great here. Great here too. Yeah. Sue the EU. Yeah, sue the EU. <laughs> Did Trump say that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as soon as someone tries diplomacy, it is – and here's another example of what I use. It's like if I, someone says, um, you know, uh, uh, Hitler starved all those Ukrainians in, in Ukraine back in the 30s, and you go, no, 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 that was Stalin's like, oh, why are you defending Hitler? 
So if she says, you know, we need to talk to Assad and work out like a, a peaceful negotiation. Oh, you want Assad to win? And, and they will say that with a straight face. No, of course. I mean, the basis for the castigation is so wrong. Just on a factual level, on a moral level, on a diplomatic level, go down the list. That I, I just have felt since she announced, and even you know, before. I'm sorry, I actually interviewed her shortly after she returned from that trip. Is she as hot in person? Uh, it was over the, over the oh, phone, dear. and I would yeah. not comment, regardless, for my she's own. She's beautiful. Is that is that wrong to point out that she's beautiful? I is it am, sexist? I am going to shy away from rendering judgment negatively or positively on any woman's looks for my own. Personal. Okay, I think I think yeah. I okay. I think it's fair to say she's extremely charismatic. I would say I, I would say she has a lot of novelty about her that people yeah. are intrigued by. Yeah. Um, and I don't think. By the way, I don't think you're a sexist necessarily if you say a woman's hot. I just don't want. To want to be. I said beautiful. <laughs> yeah, beautiful yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's just uh, I, I don't want to even have give any ammunition to anybody who might want to assume because like. When I've been writing things that are cast her in a favorable light, at least compared to the overwhelmingly negative right. media response to her thus far, of course there are like a bunch of trolls who say, "Oh, you just you want to date with her or something." It's, it's just so juvenile. So I don't even want to even say anything that could be remotely construed in a particular. Well, it's direction, just it's know? just ironic because Obama was often described how attractive he is, right? Yeah. And that word can mean physically or it could mean you know emotionally or psychologically yeah even like Mitt Romney I remember when he was running in 2012 he had like a presidential look which meant he had like a strong muscular draw, jaw line yeah. and it was like a good looking older man yeah. right so I, I get I get that there's not a consistent standard here but no whatever. I hear you I hear you. that's fair there are some concessions I'm willing to make just for practical purposes you know um, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, we we're talking about Tulsi and you were reporting on her oh yeah so I interviewed her short I interviewed her and Dennis Kucina shortly after they returned and already then you could tell that as her political profile was growing, the way that that trip was received was going to be spun furiously by her opponents. Yeah. And her opponents, the most vigorous of which I would say right now, are on the liberal left. If you talk to conservatives, libertarians and so forth, I mean, they don't have a huge problem with her. They don't like Medicare for all and Green New Deal and things that she also advocates on a domestic level. But they, I guess they feel that she doesn't – she doesn't have this kind of screechy tone that a lot of liberals now seem to who are in the right. you know, nonstop 24-7 Trump resistance crowd. So she has critiques of Trump. I mean she has strong criticisms of Trump. Of course. But they're grounded in this kind of non-shrill <laughs> – In reality. Yeah, yeah, which I think is people kind of pine for, rightly so. Um, so I think that's part of why people are – Drawn to her. What else is well? Uh, here's another example of the hypocrisy when it comes to her. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Clintons pushed forth the Defense of Marriage Act, which you know defined marriage as between a man and a woman. Uh, in 2004, not a lot of people know this. John Kerry went to Bill Clinton and asked for advice on his campaign, and Clinton told him run against gay marriage. And John Kerry said, "I'm not going to do that." And if he had done it, he probably would have won uh, the presidency. Well, it's it's plausible. He started, I don't think he could have outflanked Bush on the culture war. No, but people could have sat – I mean, look, the, it was so close. It's not implausible. It's sort of, as The status quo is he loses. Yeah. So this, it's either loses by more or he possibly wins, whatever. And Hillary Clinton famously flip-flopped on this. Terry Gross from NPR, that alt-right you know, uh, fringe Nazi outlet, asked her about her evolution. And Hillary, if you guys can look at this clip, lost her mind and said, oh, Terry, you're calling me a liar and blah, blah, blah. And it was really bizarre. The point is Hillary Clinton is now being feted as this gay rights uh, advocate hero, you know, uh, one of the greatest of all time. Tulsi Gabbard, you know, had what was a fairly mainstream view of gay rights at the time, changed her view. And she's like, look, I was wrong. And they're like, oh, my God, she's a homophobe. So the standard is complete double standard with her and Hillary. Well, I mean, yeah, but anybody's could be victimized by a double standard in relation to Hillary. I just feel like using Hillary as a foil or as like an argumentative um, counterpoint in a lot of situations is getting like a little bit played out. So I would almost want to like talk about Tulsi and her evolution on gay rights on her own terms rather than invoking Hillary because I just feel really exhausted by well, that comparison. The, my broader point is not the Hillary I, I get, point. I get, the, I get the broader point. Well, maybe the, let me just tell for the audience. But yeah. my broader point is this. this I'm saying it's the same people 
who are yes. fetting Hillary are the same ones who are attacking Tulsi That's for fair. the same. That's, That's the issue. And even Obama. I mean, I, I, I when making a comparison in the on, on this subject, I've actually brought up Obama because I can vividly remember in 2008, Obama, when he was a Democratic nominee, yeah. he convened this like prayer session at a mega church with Rick Warren, who was the most prominent evangelical leader in the country at the time, you know, maybe you could quibble with whether whether he's whether he was the most prominent i think he probably was at that time but part of their prayer session was talking about gay rights and gay marriage and obama said basically invoked a theological justification for his opposition to gay marriage so he's saying there was a scriptural basis for opposing gay marriage of course he you know qualified it saying civil unions blah 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 like the whole like mid 2000s yeah, yeah. trajectory and how yeah, this stuff right. progressed but at the t but but that really was a searing loss for a lot of gay activists that I can recall hearing from at the time. You oh, know, sure. I, I worked for a gay rights advocacy organization for, you know, in my earlier years in New Jersey in particular, um, because, you know, there was, you know, prior to the courts kind of summarily legalizing gay marriage, there was, it was, uh, there, there were questions as to whether states would legalize yeah. it, you know, through their own internal processes and, Whatever, it's, it's, it's an aside. It's just to say that I think you're right to point to the discrepancy in the reaction um, uh, in terms of like establishment Democrats and liberals who are saying that this automatically discredits Tulsi. And I should say that some of the quotes from her teens and 20s are pretty bad, I would sure. say. Um, but, you know, the way that I gauge it is, is there a way to discern whether her evolution – on this issue was purely opportunistic right. and driven by cynical political calculations, or was it a sincere change in principle as a result of her lived experience? And I think it's the latter on her part. I, mean, I, I don't, I'm not inside her brain. I'm not quote standing for her. That's my honest assessment based on looking at the facts, right? I hate that term standing. I know. Right. I love it. Though. I just found out recently <laughs> that it's from the Eminem song. I honestly did. No, I didn't. Is it? No, no. Eminem popularized it. Standing is not no, from no. Eminem. He did not I, invent that term. Not a stalker no, slash fan. Stan. It, it, the, the term is based on that song. I'm not saying Eminem himself popularized it, but it was popularized because it's based on the name of the song Stan because of the, Stan, the name. The guy in the song is named Stan, right? No, no. It's a, it's a portmanteau of Look, stalker slash fan. Maybe it's a double entendre because look at the Wikipedia article on it. It says it's based on Stan from the Eminem song. All right. We don't I mean, okay. look at we'll, it right now. Okay. I mean, it's a big emergency. Uh, <laughs> this is the emergency. I just hate that term. I hate all internet cl cliches. Not all, but most of them I just find are like so stifling. It just makes me want to clench my fist don't, and punch don't, something. Don't you think you're a little young to be a curmudgeon? I don't know. I guess <laughs> I'm a little young to be self-identifying as a curmudgeon. Maybe I'll do that eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to Tulsi, and then we can talk about internet trivia. You remind me of Picar a little. Okay. Harry I, Picar. And I, I don't – that's the American Splendor guy? Yeah. Okay. I saw that movie like a long time ago. I don't remember enough to actually he, comment I, on the movie. He wrote a book about me, is, is, so I was good, very good friends with him. So you, oh, okay. Yeah, so you have you have a similar vibe to Harvey. Okay. Well, I guess I'll take that as a It's compliment. a good thing. It's a good All thing. Right. He also didn't like – he did not like the term curmudgeon. Okay. He's like, it makes me sound like Andy Rooney. <laughs> I have a weird cognitive quirk where I can't remember movies. Okay. I, I just don't – like if you ask me about a movie I saw five years ago, I don't know I saw it, but I can't tell you anything about it. I don't yeah. know what it is. There's just some wiring that's I've not... I've gotten that way with books, which is why I have a good read, so I can remember what books I've actually read. Okay. So anyway, Tulsi, and then we can move on. Yes, sir. The... Thank, you for taking... <laughs> Thank you for taking charge of my show, because it's welcome. a I'm commandeer... catastrophe. I'm commandeering <laughs> this entire, you know, beautiful table and yeah. just making myself supreme. Um, <laughs> so her evolution, I think you can fairly conclude, was actually grounded in, a, in, in sincere change in first principles as to how she viewed the issue, which I think is compounded by the fact that she was under the wing of her domineering activist father who was involved in all kinds of kind of crazy anti-gay activism in Hawaii. Um, you know, there are some intricacies there in terms of the Polynesian community in Hawaii and their connections to religious groups. So I think Tulsi has an answer for all that. But if you look at the apology that she put out last week, it was it, it had a it had a connotation of sincerity that I think is rare in terms of politician apologies. Yeah. Right? It was it, she actually you know she acknowledged her error. She 
said that she regretted how it was hurtful at the time, and then she gave a plausible explanation for how she became to shed those views. Um, whereas in the case of Hillary Obama, it's nothing but opportunism. And people were willing to look past that for, you know, because they felt that their overall, overall political uh, interests aligned with those candidates. And they were willing to, you know, which is, I guess, reasonable to conclude that if that's what you perceive to be your self-interest. But at the same time, you can't then, you know, five or ten years later, use a set of new criteria to automatically disqualify somebody who actually, at core, seems to have evolved for more sincere reasons than any of those other Democratic superstars do. Uh, you, you hit on something, and I, I'm very curious to hear your point of view on this. Glenn Greenwald's very strong on this issue, and I love, and he's, you know, he lives in Brazil, I believe he's gay. Uh, what do you think, no, this is why I ask, you are for gay apps, you're always, what do you think of the frequent gay baiting by people on the left, is often in the form of jokes by Republicans that they don't like? Elaborate. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, you precisely? have like what was it, Jimmy Kimmel being like, "Oh, Mike Pence is a total bottom." Or, oh, or it's stuff like. Oh, that. Oh yeah, I mean, I guess the most egregious version of that now is like saying that Trump and Putin are butt buddies and yes. stuff, and like they have their people. There, there are murals around the world, literally, of them making out, Trump and Putin. Right. So, I'm not personally that offended by it. Frankly, I think you know it's satirizing something that people think is true. Like they have like an unnaturally close relationship and whatever. I'm not going to get interesting choice of words. <laughs> yeah, well, right. <laughs> right. So, but, but I think it's totally hypocritical on their part because in most other contexts, they would furiously denounce right. that kind of humor being used to sully some political figure or cultural figure. So I think it's more about – it's less about when, whether I feel negatively about it and more like what does it say about the inconsistent standards that they apply – to various yeah, that's things. exactly how I take it as yeah. well. Uh, and Greenwald's really, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're a fan of his as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a stan. You're a stan? Wait, so who, <laughs> I mean, who are you a, a, a fan of in the, in our political discourse? Who do you, who do you, whose takes do you like to hear, even if you don't agree? Whose takes do I like? Besides Bill Crystal. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't have like a set roster of people whose takes all automatically look at you know really not really i mean it's kind of i guess i'm so kind of worn down by stu the constant swirl of stupidity that it kind of diminished my ability to even have a roster of people like that i mean obviously i read remote stuff you know yeah when it comes out right um uh but yeah it's sad but like beyond that i don't have a whole lot i mean i i like ross douthit okay him um, not because I agree, I may have to put this big, big fat qualifier in, of course, but because he actually has a unique, I feel like he gets at certain cultural and political tensions in a way that few others do to the okay. point that it actually pro provokes interesting discussion way more than the liberal or left columnist at the New York Times with the possible exception now of Michelle Goldberg. I don't know if she's like a formal columnist per se. I mean, cor sorry, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but whatever her role is, I just lost my breath for some reason. Um, she, uh. She, she occasionally does similar. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't want to shout out random people um, because it's kind of weird. But. Well, who was the last person who like actually made you think? Made me think? Yeah. <sighs> and question like some of your views. I'm trying to remember. I, mean, I, I, love, I still love Michael Brandon Doherty. Um, okay. Uh, I've been reading him like since I first started online commentary, whatever. But I, mean, I was really in the world. So I, I'll read most – anything he publishes okay uh, and i'm not trying to flatter anybody frankly i'm just like kind of giving you an honest yeah rehearsal you're not my... flattering anybody you yeah. don't say everyone sucks everyone kind of sucks <laughs> but i'll read them you know regardless okay let's how about this one what books have been most influential in your uh um philosophical upbringing oh man i should i should have uh, brushed up on my uh, academic uh history i i read a lot of david hume i mean okay i, I kind of studied philosophy in college right okay. so the philo the classical philosopher I don't know you know the big name philosopher that I most identified with kind of an, on an intuitive level was Hume, um, and I couldn't write a term paper on Hume at the moment. I'd have to like you know spend a week and kind of refamiliarize myself with various things. But that I feel like informs my kind of constitutional approach to things. You know, like empiricism. Okay. Um, Would you skept consider being skeptical about? Claims of causation between disparate yeah. phenomena. Um, 
which I think actually causes a lot of media failure, you know, overinterpreting the relationship between two objects and assuming that there's a causal connection between the two. People should go read David Hume at some point. I mean, it's amazing what he accomplished at 25 he, when he put out his treatises. Um, Would you consider yourself a humorist? <laughs> I just consider myself humorous. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and, you know, I also studied religion in college. So the varieties of religion, religious experience yeah. was, was big in terms of developing an appreciation for how the religious fervor can overtake almost anybody yes. irrespective of whether they affirm belief in monotheism or any kind of other kind of theism or if they're a staunch secularist. Um, that's, I think, also useful for analyzing politics. Um, so those are two. I'm trying to think. I just um, – I'll give you a more recent one. I read – a book, I actually tweeted about this book recently, and this is not a huge philosophical work, but it, it's, inter it's, it's instructive for understanding current developments. There's a book by William Keller. Okay. The, called The Liberals in the FBI. Uh-huh. Oh, the, sorry, The Liberals in J. Edgar, J. Edgar, Edgar Hoover that goes through the history dating back to the 50s of how prominent liberals like, you know, Hubert Humphrey um, and – various other like, you know, prominent senators and people who were, you know, were considered as presidential candidates, how their approval was absolutely necessary in the FBI accruing additional surveillance powers to itself and accruing autonomy to itself so it could work within the executive branch without being constrained by any kind of democratic checks. And I think a lot of that precedent is relevant now as we look at what the FBI is doing in relation to Trump and the stuff that keeps coming out about, you know, whether investigation was open, counterintelligence, blah, blah, blah. It's just very useful historical context. So those would be my three answers. At the yeah. I, I talk about this in my forthcoming book, how Nixon for the counterexample gave a lot of uh, progressive ideas. He implemented them. And because when you are on the right, you have the liberty to do that. And when you're on the left, you have the liberty to act right. Cause no one is going to question you. We got a good question from the chat room. Why is Michael Tracy so much more handsome than his Twitter avatar suggests? <laughs> Jeez, you know, I, we were talking before the show. Yeah. Every time I meet somebody in person who only knows me from the Twitter avatar, which is such a silly thing, but but they say, oh my God, I thought you were like 25 years older than you are. Like, yeah. I don't know. All I did was say, it was like, it was sometime in late 2016, I felt like I needed a new profile image. So I said, can somebody make me one? And here's a video of me talking at the camera. Just use that. And that's what I got. So that's what I'm going with. I mean, maybe if you if you have a different one to give me, maybe I'll I'll consider it. <laughs> okay. But is that some of my own looks? I don't know. I guess it's just good genetics. <laughs> uh, where'd you grow up? New Jersey. Where? Uh, West Essex. Um, I actually just wrote about this for the first time publicly because I went to a Sopranos 20th anniversary okay. panel discussion. I wrote about the Sopranos, but the Sopranos was filming where I grew up. You know, because I live, they're from North Caldwell. The Soprano family lived in North Caldwell. I lived in another Caldwell, so it was like right adjacent. And um, uh, so I can remember, you know, growing up and like see, going to see them, the film crews on location oh. and things. And one thing I mentioned in that piece was, which was published at The Spectator like two and a half weeks ago. So if somebody wants to go look it up, do so. Or don't, I don't care. Um, <laughs> uh <laughs> I can see why that's your avatar because you're like a cartoon. Oh, okay. Fine, I don't care. Yab, yabba dabba do. Um, I forget my. So I was going to say that. So where I grew up, there there are certain references in that show, and you're just laughing and just totally missing what I'm about to say. But I can so give you a moment to Michael Tracy. I'll give you a moment to gather yourself. Um, uh, but in that show, which is it really is an incredible show. I know it's kind of a cliche to say so, but I actually think. It's true, but it's multiple more additional levels of amazing for me because in the show, there are references to as minute geographic things as street corners Yeah, that you would only know literally if you were from that t tiniest of geographic spans of area. Um, 
So anyway, I just kind of... No, I, I absolutely love it when there... If, I'm going to use the word art as broadly as possible, when there's authenticity in art. So when you have yeah. a book and they make a reference to, like, those of us who grew up in Bensonhurst, the guy who stood on the corner of Bay Parkway and 86th Street and rocked back and forth, and he did this for 20 years. Like, if you know about that guy, it's like, okay, you know this neighborhood. So, and that's also so much... And for everyone else, they're going to miss it. But for you, it's like, okay, this is real. They yeah. did their homework. They know what they're talking about. Yeah, there was nothing on the show that you're like, oh, that's implausible. It's like, it was too plausible. It was, like, scary. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, how did you actually get a, get your start in journalism? <sighs> Every time I'm asked a question, I do a heavy sigh. People have actually called me out on that, but I I can never. I love it so I'm not much. I'm not cognizant enough of it to like, catch myself prior to doing it. Still, <laughs> um, so I just have to go with the sign. I you know I kind of got into it. <laughs> I love you so much. Yeah. You I are love... so. This is so much better than I thought it was going to be. Okay, can I? Can I? Can I? <laughs> can I like withhold my love so it's not reciprocal right now? So I want to like <laughs> you know play hard to get. Okay, I get it. The Ayn Rand position, yeah. Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> are you all right? Should we take a break? I'm fine. Guys? I'm having fun. What's wrong with Jamie? Having... What's wrong? <laughs> don't please don't address them directly. <laughs> what is wrong with having a good time? People are. <laughs> We we are so blessed in this country. We are so you and I are so personally blessed. I don't There's, know. Humor is like fascistic now or something, right? So we can't have too good of a time. Uh, okay. Well, we are in the gas chamber, so it's perfectly fine. Oh god. They allowed me to call it that. I'm Jewish. I went to yeshiva. I basically got in the attic. I got into journalism haphazardly. Like okay. I didn't, it wasn't my burning ambition growing up. I, mean, I read a little, bit, a little bit, you know, for the high school paper and things. Mostly like complaining about cops. Um, but. Yeah, you know, later on, I just felt like the the, the 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 people who like were in the formal journalism program at my school and elsewhere because I would interact with them at different you know, places, usually like political conferences or whatever. They always were like the most boring people at the school by far because they wanted this careerist path where they would get the internship for the local paper and they would like, oh my god, maybe I'll be at the yeah. Washington Post at some day. And ninety five percent of them just end up in PR and within five years, yeah. And if you talk to like a most prominent, I don't want to say most, but many prominent journalists that you'll speak to now on the right and left will say something similar to that. It's not like an ideological contention. I actually wrote a big piece on this for The Nation magazine. One of my first big pieces for them years ago was on this, um, you know, the futility of the journalism major, you know. But I, I thought it was not just futile, but like harmful. So I kind of found, I yeah. started a magazine in opposition to them and, and – uh, that was how I started, and then I went from there. All right, let me talk to you guys about Blinkist, which is a great idea for an app. Some of you had day jobs. You don't, you're not like me sitting at home all the time. You don't have the time to sit and read all these books like I do as a loser. Blinkist takes care of that. It's an app that gives you the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books, and condenses them down to just 15 minutes. Most books, you don't need to read the whole book. You just need to know what this is basically about the gist. That way you were at the party, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I read that. Here's what it's about. Oh, you're so well read. Blinkist, that's how. Go to Blinkist.com slash malice. You get a free seven-day trial. And here's what kind of stuff you get. You can use it the Blinkist when you're driving your car, when you're making breakfast, going to bed. Here's some of the books they have. They got everything. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Tim Ferriss, Four Hour Work Week, you got it down to 15 minutes. Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goldman, Fire and Fury, the Michael Wolf book, all the big bestsellers, they have them there. If you go to Blinkist.com slash Malice, you get your free seven-day trial, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist, as in Blink, and you'll be telling me you're welcome. Uh, is there anyone who you really want to meet who you'd be excited to meet? <laughs> Dead or alive? No, alive. Alive. Okay. I was going to say Gandolfini, but... Um, I think I would like to meet... I don't know. Is it like a... Can I say a politician just because I would want to ask sure. some questions? Absolutely. I would like to meet Trump, I guess. Yeah. What would you ask I him? shouted a question at Trump. Oh. During one of the uh, uh, Republican primary debates in 2016. Because I went... I finagled my way into one of them. It's, which is t a total shit show you know, those of things. course it's, it's a, just a bunch of journalists like sitting around pretending like they're doing something important they're not even like they could be on the other side of the country and they'd be doing essentially the same thing except for when the some of the 
candidates to come out and take questions, and Trump did. I mean, one of his, one of the ways that he actually set himself apart, at least in that early phase of the primary, was being like almost tediously available to everybody. Yeah, not everybody, but you know, more so than like Marco Rubio or something. Um, so I shouted a question to Trump, and he was like, "I don't want to answer that." And then that was it. <laughs> That's very funny. Well, I, I asked him because, um, like, Ted Cruz had made a remark in that debate. I don't know if you remember. Like, he's like, "We should carpet bomb ISIS." Yeah. It was like, "Hey, hey, Don, <laughs> you agree with that?" And like, you're like, "I don't want to talk about it." Okay. <laughs> but that's as far as I I would like to have a, you know, I think it'd be fascinating to have like a one-on-one conversation slash interview with any president. I mean, I felt the same way about Obama. So what would be the first question you'd want to ask Trump? Jeez. I know what mine would be. (laughs) It wouldn't be about his hair. I feel like that's been done. I guess. I don't, I feel like you have to have a uh, sort of scene setting introductory conversation, a a question that I could only really come up with if I was in the moment with him. Right. So I would want to get to substance, but it would have to be like preceded by some, you know, let's get casual and sure. talkative introductory questions. So I think it's a little difficult to say. I mean, they would want to talk mostly about foreign policy with him. Okay. Um, you know, it'd be a, I, one of the things I want, had wanted to ask him until like two months ago or whatever, you know, or a month or so ago was about Syria because he ran in 2016 saying, you know, basically more or less, let's get out of Syria. Yeah. Let's not do with the conventional foreign policy consensus right. said that we ought to do in Syria. And yet for almost two years of his term that we were doing the conventional foreign policy stuff yeah. in Syria, for the most part, I mean, that he tinkered around the edges. He stopped the CIA program that funded the quote rebels who were supposed to be the moderate rebels and ended up being like the Al Qaeda rebels. So not really moderate. Um, so I wanted to ask him like, Hey, what's going on with that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I guess, you know, on that note, I would ask him about the elements within his administration, which are clearly trying to undermine various aspects of what he's attempting to achieve in terms of foreign policy. So I want to like cajole him into denouncing John Bolton somehow. So like John Bolton have to resign disgrace. So that would be like my major question. I think I was on uh, Fox right when they announced Bolton and I lost my shit on air (laughs) really bad. What did you do? Uh, because so it was the Kennedy show and, and Tom Shalhoub was guest hosting and I was always a panelist on red eye, a frequent panelist and Bolton was nicknamed the president of red eye. I was, I was never on red eye with him and it, it, the show was at eight, like they announced at seven fifty five, and he had been scheduled to be on the show anyway. So oh, they, yeah. he was there. So Tom, and I, I wrote questions for Tom Shalhoub because he had said, uh, vis-a-vis North Korea, which is my beat that, um, basically if South Korea we shouldn't even check in with South Korea if we decide we need to bomb North Korea. He and this was the Wall Street Journal, yeah, and I he, said he was, he was calling for a preemptive yeah, first strike, yeah, right? and 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 not even warning South Korea, yeah. who would be obviously the victims of this. Because the, the, uh, and I I told Tom I wrote that down, and Tom asked, and Bolton was just like, oh, like what I said in the past is different. Now I'm advising the president, so, he, Wait, so he, it was a fair answer, I guess. But I was just this guy. It, 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 it was it was rough. So Bolton was appeared on the show after it was announced that he was selected? yes, like minutes. He I, I mean he was it's via satellite. He wasn't in the studio, but like I, I'm looking at the monitor. I spoke to there him briefly in, in Washington a couple of weeks prior to him being announced because he gave some remarks at like one of the fake universities that are in downtown D.C. that were basically just funneling operatives into various parts of the national security apparatus. Um. And he gave a, you know, Bolton-y speech. And I, you know, just a- afterwards I talked to him about Russia. And he took a hawkish view on Russia because he was talking not just on Russia broadly, but on the Russian interference, quote unquote, and what should be done in, in response. And, you know, when Bolton was selected, I kind of said, hey, I got this quote from Bolton, like seemingly contradicting Trump's attitude toward Russia. And nobody seemed to care. So, yeah, uh, he's from Jersey, though. Is he? Yeah, that's the thing people don't realize about him. He's a Jersey boy. Hmm. Well, all right, I guess he's good. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what were you like as a kid? Were you this sardonic? Jeez, oh, I don't know. You don't know? What do you mean you don't know? I don't spend days like toiling about my 
I don't know. I just feel like I never would. <laughs> were you shy? Were you a loud mouth? Were you a class clown? Opinionated? I guess like a combination of those. Okay. Like I was, I don't wouldn't say shy, but maybe a little more reserved than some of my peers. But at the same time, I like did stuff like, like performing at talent shows and things. So oh, like, like what? What were your talents? <laughs> I didn't have really talents, but I just wanted, felt like performing at the talent show. So what did you perform? Well, I mean, there was one time where, like, we there was a thing called the, uh, I don't know why we're getting into this, but there was, like, a thing where, like, the, the uh, cause I was in the band, right? So the school band. Okay. So there was a thing where the, every year there would be this all-day band performance where the band, the chorus, the orchestra, everybody would be doing something, and then kids would also perform over the course of the day. So, like, I performed, like, the Beatles song. And, you know, what what instrument did you play? For that, I didn't. I, I, for that performance, again, I don't know why we're discussing this, but for that performance, I didn't play an instrument. I sang. Oh, okay. But in the school band, I played the uh, clarinet. I'll tell you why we're discussing this because I've had this happen to me. When someone is an interesting personality uh, and who has interesting points of view, then it becomes like, all right, let's start unpacking and how we got to this place. All right. Well, I, am I the first person to ask you questions like this? <laughs> I don't. I I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know, I just get annoyed when people ask me about that. Kind you of get thing. annoyed by it. Seems like yeah. it seems like all the questions I've asked you are annoying. It reminds me of like uh, I don't know a psychotherapy thing or something. I don't I don't have a problem with it. So why are we going? I mean, all right, ask whatever you want. It's fine. <laughs> I'm annoyed. I don't have a problem. <laughs> ask you whatever you want. I'm annoyed <sighs> and I don't have a problem. And I guess I do have a problem. And now I'm just going to leave. I mean, do you feel like I'm prying? No, no. Okay, it's just my temperament. I have a great temperament. <laughs> Doesn't Trump? Doesn't that Trump's line? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, no. That, yeah, that, that was. Oh, my mic. That was Trump's line during the debate. He's well, like, it was. It was never his line actually, but like people were always calling it to question his quote temperament, and then he just adopted it and said, "I have the best temperament." Yeah. No, and no. We that, like, okay. You don't remember? I remember the exact quote because I watched it. I'd say once every other week. It was the second presidential debate. The first question was uh, to to Carly Fiorina, uh, and they said, "What do you think about having Trump with his finger the nuclear button?" And she had this, you know, double talk. And then it goes to Trump and he goes, why is Rand Paul here? He's at 1% of the polls. We got too many people. He shouldn't be here. And it's like, my temperate is excellent. And didn't he like make fun of Rand Paul's looks? No, because then Rand Paul goes, short, fat, ugly, thin. My goodness, didn't we get past this in junior high? And Trump goes, I never went after him for his looks. And there's plenty of material there. Believe me, that I could tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And know. Rand Paul chuckled. Yep. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think back to that. I feel like there would have been a way to call into question whether you want a guy like Trump with his finger on the nuclear button that didn't like repair to tropes about temperament that people kind of roll their eyes at. Right. You know, who do you think is the biggest uh, fraud in politics today? <laughs> I mean, I can make a case for Trump. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know if I want to because it'd be a little cliche. Maybe I could. I'll, I'll make a case. Here, here's the case for okay. Trump. He ran. The reason that he won the presidency was because he put forth a heterodox policy agenda. Yes. For a Republican. Yes. That's why he won the primary and why he won the general election. It's not the only reason why he won both things, but it's a factor, right? And what did he do when he assumed office? Well, I mean, for the most part, he outsourced his legislative agenda to Paul freaking Ryan. Yeah who was opposed to Trump, had called him a racist during the campaign. Told him he should uh, get pull the nomination when that pussy tape came out. Uh, yeah, he abandoned him at a crucial juncture. Yeah. So everybody talks about how Trump is petty and uh, vindictive, and I guess he is on some level, but you'd think he would actually call, make the person who did those things that Paul Ryan didn't pay a price politically, but he didn't. He just like, he said, whatever, I'm the head of the... Republican Party now, so they're like, we're all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya. So he outsourced his entire legislative agenda to the re congressional Republicans. And it turned out, and so he expended all his political capital on repealing Obamacare, which they didn't end up doing, and on a big tax cut, which is like, when the tax cut bill was passed in December 2017, if he ever winded the clock back a year and a half, you're like, what's going to be the big, what are going to be the fruits of a Trump presidency? It'll be something having to do with his heterodox style right. and approach but no it became total orthodox so i think i feel like if he had the personal will to actually override the pressures within the gop caucus which are to conform to the more orthodox style of just oligarch and yeah, yeah. stuff then he could have done so i mean he has a huge billy public he can do one tweet and a guy's political career could be over 
but he chose not to. So I feel like that's a decent case to, to call him a fraud. And another way for that is one of the big promises during the campaign is he knew all these great negotiators and he knew the bad ones and I know the good ones and that he, what he was going to come in is his cabinet would be all these like outside the box people. Yeah, and yeah. it's just textbook. It was all Republicans that you've heard of. Yeah. You know, except Goldman for Zach, maybe, uh, except for the secretary of state, which was ex which was completely crazy to me. Well, I mean, I, I actually thought that, that the Tillerson pick was one of the more promising quote unquote picks just because it wasn't from the, you know, typical sure. uh, roster of Republican retreads. Um, and, I think Pompeo is a lot worse, frankly, than Tillerson. Um, I think, you know, but for whatever reason, that dynamic fell apart pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, but I could also make a case that, you know, he's not as fraudulent as maybe the initial case that they made. Suggested. Okay. So, I don't know. I just, uh, I think they're all frauds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree with you completely. <laughs> uh, who do you think? Including myself. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you think Warren Not has those a, guys? Don't. No, don't please don't point to them either. <laughs> uh, they get spooked easily. Uh, uh, who do you think Warren has a chance? Do I think Warren has a chance? Yeah, I think she has a chance. I okay. mean, I think everybody has a chance. I don't know that you can authoritatively proclaim anybody as not having a chance, except for like the most fringe idiot. I, th I don't think Gillibrand has a chance. No, I don't think she has much of a chance. So yeah. maybe you can. Um, I think uh, the. The, the really interesting dynamic is going to be what, how do Sanders and Warren interface? Like, how do they na navigate that tension, if you can call it a tension between them? It's a tension, at least in terms of some of the voters they draw on. Maybe, um, maybe there's not quite as much overlap as people might have thought between the Sanders and Warren bases. I don't know. There's a lot of open questions there. Can I say one thing? Yeah. You would probably have more inside knowledge than I, so this could be coming from complete ignorance. Mm -hmm. I don't think Bernie's going to run. I don't think Tulsi would have run uh, unless she knew Bernie wasn't running. Well, I don't know that that's true. I, I, I'm not saying it's certain, but I'm saying she quit the DNC because of how they were treating him. She knows she'd split the ticket with him. She's young, so there's no rush. So in my view, if she's running, that means she has inside information he's not. That's my opinion. I, I don't think it's true. Okay. Um, I think... I think she has an understanding with parts of the Sanders operation that they can be complementary to each other in a way. I mean, foreign policy was never Sanders' strong suit. So, you know, that's what she's going to be talking about for the most part. It's like what she's taken the most action on in Congress. She became one of the foremost opponents of regime change in the entire Congress. So I think they have different uh, wheelhouse wheelhouses that can sure. actually be complementary. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't read the tea leaves that way. I mean, every other indication is that he is running. Okay. I mean, he's going to be in South Carolina addressing the Democratic caucus there. Why would you be doing that? You know? Um, so I think he's running. Um, but I think it's probably 90 to 95% certain. You think Hillary's going to run? I just think, you know, it's actually a power move on Sanders' part to delay an announcement. Sure, of course. Time. Absolutely. So I don't think it's, I don't think he's any, in any rush. My favorite sponsor is HeshiSocks.com. H E S H I socks.com. And if you use promo code welcome30, you get 30% off. And here's why I love these socks. I wear them all the time. They're my house socks. They're the most comfortable kick ass fashion socks for work or play. If you're wearing typical socks, they give you no protection. Heshi socks are cushioned in the footbed, the heel, and the toe for maximum comfort. They've got arch support in the center of the foot, and they're made with high end Pima cotton, which is super soft. Highly breathable and absorbent if your feet sweat. It's also antimicrobial. Kills the bacteria, keeps your feet from stinking. So basically, they're helping you get laid when you take your shoes off. They've got a bunch of styles. They've got the basic stuff, and they got the fashionable stuff. Wear them with shoes, dress shoes, sneakers, not with sandals. You are not allowed to wear socks with sandals. If you go to heshisocks.com, H-E-S-H-I socks.com, and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off do you think hillary's gonna run no yeah i don't see it either no there was a moment there where it seemed like it was like a glimmer of a possibility but uh, no there's no there's nothing in the works there you're gonna start sighing but that's okay i've got a question for you okay what was it like working with the young turks it was good okay and i'm um, you know people can ask me any kind of adversarial question they want about the young turks i had a lot of freedom to do what i wanted that's okay. my main objective in life yeah um so, you know, didn't always agree with the main line taken, but there was no obligation that I do agree. Um, and, you know, they tolerated a lot of dissension, I would say. So, um, you know, 
insofar as I was able to do what I wanted and not be constrained in any way, then it was good. Yeah, I had no Miki. Did you work with her? She was yeah. my guest two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's uh, running for a public advocate now. Correct. Right? Yeah. I can't get too worked up about that office for whatever reason. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, no, no. Best of luck, but no, no. I was asking her about it, and she's basically like, you know, I can. The job is to make a scene for yeah. people who need to make a scene about. It. I'm like, oh, okay. It's a good job because they're like, there's no, you don't have any obligations to do anything. You could just yeah. sit in your hat in your underwear at home and you're fulfilling your duties because I don't think there are any prescribed duties. Well, and she's also made the point. She's like, I don't actually want to use this as a stepping stone to be mayor. So, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I should withhold. Let's just yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, who are you most hopeful is going to run? Who would be your candidate if Bernie does? I mean, you got Bernie, then you got Tulsi. These are two good ones to pick from. I actually think that the way that they could, those two could complement each other could be really – They'd be a great fruitful. ticket. Well, possibly. I, I, I think that the mainstream – well, I mean I think there are a lot of people surrounding Bernie now that are connected to the mainstream democratic orbit much more so than 2016. If you look at some of his staff members – they kind of seamlessly transitioned to jobs, you know, collecting email data and things for Democratic Party organs. So I have to assume there are a lot more people like that now in his orbit. I, I know that to be true. So I think there's going to be pressure, should he win the nomination, to make a move as a running mate who doesn't further alienate. Oh, yeah, an establishment running mate. Right. Yep, yep, absolutely. More stop, more in the along the lines of an establish, conventionally establishment person right. than, say, Tulsi. Yeah. Because there are going to be questions of, can he keep together the Democratic yep. coalition? There are a lot of people who strongly, strongly hate him and blame him for the 2016 oh, yeah. law. So he's going to have to placate those people. I'm sure that makes you happy when you hear that line. I like the hatred. Yes. <laughs> that, right, yeah. I try to engender and foment yes. the hatred because I yeah. find it amusing and also actually illustrative. Yeah. Um, because I feel like you know unity is not something that I aspire to. I like disunity. Oh yeah, that's see. That's why you were the most requested guest. That's all. I'm, I'm all about break it down, break that fuck it, burn it, burn that fucker down. Oh, um, don't, what, don't burn it down necessarily. Just make it a little less unified. Well, that's where you and I differ. Okay. Um, we'll what, burn some things down. Like. What do you think? Is, what thing that the Republicans poll do you find most uh, upsetting? Restate the question. Of all the things that the Republicans do nowadays. Oh, okay. What do you find most upsetting? Jeez. Well. I mean, I think there's in the Republican coalition, there's always a constant lurch to grasp onto the latest culture war controversy. Uh -huh. And I'm not, I'm not absolving Democrats because they do sure. something similar in, in an inverted way or whatever. But for the Republicans, there is this constant lurch. I mean, go back to we were talking about the 2004 election. Gay marriage was the big one then. Oh, yeah. Because they need to pre – people fighting and preoccupied about some hot-button culture war issue constantly. And I don't think this is a – you know, there's a lot of literature and a lot of discussion about this going back decades. And I think it's a little different now than it had been in previous eras. But th that tendency is still there. So I think there's a there's always a desire along with their kind of media sycophants in the conservative world to keep fueling the flames of these kind of ridiculous culture war controversies. And actually this, th this thing with the MAGA hack kids – it's actually another incarnation of that. With that, it's a little different because there was some media malfeasance in terms of how it was initially represented. So the grievance they have is not totally misplaced. But like yeah. two weeks from now, people forget about that. And there'll be another thing that they're trying to latch on to because they want people fighting about, you know, that in, in ways that create this kind of false sense of polarization in the populace. And I think that's really destructive. And I mean, if you want to, you know, if you want a, a less identity based politics and populous then you can't keep fomenting identity controversies constantly just because you're on the right and like you're making fun of somebody you know you know uh, with a pronoun or something i mean i feel like that 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 disposition is really irritating yeah you know I what hear, i mean i hear what you're saying like it, like it, if you need to pick on the transgender people who want to use their own bathroom like this is your target yeah yeah i mean maybe if you want to drill down into the nuances of the transgender bathroom issue there are some ways that you could accuse liberals of hypocr hypocrisy. I don't know. It's just like, if that's your overwhelming burning focus in life, then your life is a little weird, you know? <laughs> right. Maybe you should kind of reevaluate. <laughs> right. Okay. That, that's absolutely fair. Um, I, I mean, what was your reaction to election night, uh, 2016? I was so, I was, I felt physically ill all election day. And I, oh. I think it was actually the first time I can recall feeling ill, not because of some endemic, physiological issue 
but because I actually was uh, just responding to real world events. I can't explain why. It was like dread combined with, I, I don't know, what. It, but it, I, I really felt physically ill. So I went to sleep. Wow. I went to sleep at like, <laughs> it, it was, it was like, it was, it seemed like such an anticlimactic thing. Right. But in a way it was sort of fitting because I don't know, that's maybe how I would write it if I were writing some kind of stupid, you know, memoir. I, I don't know. But I, around eight 30. So I saw like the initial results from Florida go and I was in Wilmington, North Carolina. Cause I was there just kind of talking to voters and things, um, for vice at the time. And, um, I, uh, I, yeah, I was just overwhelmed by this sense of dread that had manifested as like physical discomfort. It's so, like, you know what? I'm going to lie down and go to bed. I, I didn't know what else to do. So at like nine o'clock at night, I, I, I went to sleep. I, and then some of the initial results that come in. So there was that one county, Vigo County in Indiana, which is like the bellwether county. So like every presidential winner going back, I don't know how long, decades. If you win Vigo County, Indiana, you win. And there were early indications that Trump was like, running away in Vigo County. So I was like, okay, this is getting interesting, <laughs> but I'm still going to go to sleep. So I get up, I, I, I go to sleep and um, I wake up probably around 1 a.m. To, to text with like, oh my God, what's going on? Oh my God, oh my God. You know, I'm like, huh, I guess I should investigate how the election is transpiring. Yeah, yeah. And I just pulled up the New York Times map and the Midwest is red. I'm like, oh my God. Well, you knew the Midwest was going to be red. That wasn't a question. Well, it was. A, there was a question as to whether Michigan and Wisconsin. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sure, sure. I, I, at the Upper Midwest, well, yeah. I, so the first thing I saw was the Upper Midwest. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Where the, like Minnesota was too close to call. Yeah. That Michigan that, red, that Wisconsin happening. red. Yeah. That should not. And be that's happening. how you knew that there was some you know watershed thing. Yeah. Uh, so, what grade? Were, here's the one that I drives me crazy, and we'll, we'll end on this question: How would you compare President Trump to President Bush? Oh, geez. Well, you have to start by President Bush. <laughs> the late President Bush or the, the, the yeah? second? Okay. Ju uh, he's not I, a junior. I, I, I knew you meant yeah. that. Well, I mean, my fa Trump's, I mean, the, the main thing you have to say about George W. Bush is that he launched a preemptive war in Iraq that caused huge. I know. We're still, we're still dealing I, with the ramifications. So Trump has not done that. So that's like a comparative point in his favor. It's not a high bar to pass necessarily, but, you know, that's the one thing that springs to mind. And I think, you know, legitimately so. Let me talk to you guys about Infinite CBD. They've got the cleanest, healthiest, and purest form of CBD available. Now, CBD has gotten more popular. I know you guys are seeing it everywhere, and that's because the stuff works. It gives you the benefits of marijuana without getting high. And InfiniteCBD.com, if you use the promo code WELCOME15, you get 15% off. And here's what you can get there. They have PM pills, right? So that's CBD plus melatonin to help you go to sleep. I use melatonin sometimes, and I hate it. Because you fall asleep, but then you're groggy the next day. If you have a both CBD and melatonin, you actually get that peaceful rest. They've got a topical cream. It's called Freezing Point. It reduces inflammation. Great on sore muscles, things that hurt. In the morning, CBD and caffeine, their AM pills, helps you get work done. And we love working with Infinite CBD here at Guest Digital because it's the absolute highest quality CBD on the market. They have this double extraction method where the end result is infinite CBD products that are over 99% CBD. Other companies use CBD oil. This is pure CBD isolate and is the highest quality CBD product you can take. And according to studies, 42% of CBD users have stopped using traditional medications. So if you go to infinitecbd.com and use promo code WELCOME15, you get 15% off. Uh, do you think Mike Pence would be a better president than Trump? No. They'd be worse. I think so. I, I, I don't understand... I, I don't hate when people say I don't understand, but I, I completely disagree with people on the left in any sense, even moderates, who think Bush is better than Trump or that Pence would be better than Trump. I don't get it. I think Pence would be just an avatar for conventional, unreconstructed Bush era politics, which gave rise to Trump in the first place. So it would be like a reversion in a sick, disgusting and way. And culturally, I, I would find his views abhorrent, and I'm not using that word loosely. Yeah, I, th I think I think you know he's obviously I don't know if he's a sincere believer, but he actually he has the appearance of being a sincere believer. Where Trump does not, although I mean Trump is still the champion of certain people who have fervent evangelical Christian beliefs because he just you know lets them appoint whatever judges they want and so forth. So I mean, there's a there, there, there's a I think there's a reasonable debate there to be had. Sure. I, my I come down on the side. No, depends though. Okay, awesome, uh, Michael Tracy. This has been edifying it's and it's been annoying but it's not I, i've been, I haven't been I'm, I'm sorry you were annoyed i'm i'm glee i'm 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 a kind of a combination of annoyed and also delighted 
<laughs> so gassy. Yeah. Gassy? Gassy? Yeah. Is it gas? I need a roid. <laughs> okay, I'll see you all next week. You are welcome. <laughs>